folks, it's uh, 6.04, so let's get started. Welcome. Today is November 12th, 2019, and it is now 6.04 p.m. My name is John Lake, Supervisor with the Division of Marine Fisheries. I'm here tonight to officiate this hearing and hearing regarding proposed amendments to Rhode Island Marine Fisheries regulations on the behalf of DEM Director Janet Elkway. With me today from the division are Pete Duhamel, Nicole Costa, Scott Olszewski, Christina Hosmith, uh, Julia Livermore, and Rich Pabluskas. Tonight's hearing concerns proposed amendments to five separate Rhode Island Marine Fisheries regulations concerning several regulatory proposals, which were publicly noticed on October 30th, 2019, pursuant to the requirements of the Rhode Island General Laws, Chapter 42-35, Administrative Procedures, and the Office of Rhode Island Secretary of State under the authority of Rhode Island General Law, 42-17.1. Pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act, an annotated regulations showing the proposed changes have been filed with the Secretary of State's office, showing proposed changes oh, sorry, at the time of noticing, and which are provided on both the Secretary of State's and Division's website. Interested persons are strongly encouraged to review these documents to fully understand the proposals brought forward tonight. The purpose of this hearing is to afford interested parties an opportunity to submit data opinions, and or arguments concerning the proposed rulemaking, or how such proposed action can be changed to minimize the impact on those affected while still achieving the required goals. This hearing is not a forum for discussing, debating, arguing, or otherwise having any dialogue. Please limit any questions to clarifying questions only. Please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and will be made available in the, on the division's webpage. For tonight's hearing, the division will provide a PowerPoint presentation summarizing each of the proposals. Again, you're encouraged to review the annotated regulations and public notice. For each hearing items, the following process will be observed. First, the chair will recognize the speakers. Second, no more than five minutes will be allowed for a presentation or comments. Third, when you are recognized, please clearly identify yourself by name and affili affiliation if appropriate. Provide your comments. If desired, please provide a written copy of your statement. If comments are extensive, if comments are extensive, it is strongly encouraged that comments be provided in writing in order to assure that the record is clear. The public comment period will conclude at 4 p.m. on November 29th. The record of this public hearing and comments will be provided to the Rhode Island Marine Fisheries Council for consideration at their meeting on December 2nd at which time the council will provide a recommendation to the director on each item. The director has an option to file the rules and regulations with the Secretary of State as is, file the rules and regulations with minor changes, or make additional amendments to the rules and regulations and hold a new public hearing. If filed, these rules and regulations become effective 20 days after filing and have the effect of law. Prior to, the, prior to hearing comments, the following exhibits have been uh, noticed for, uh, has been no noted for the record. Exhibit one is a copy of the public notices and annotated regulations that were filed with the Secretary of State on October 19th. Exhibit two is a copy of the slides presented at tonight's hearing. Exhibit three is a written comment from the town doc regarding commercial summer flounder and black sea bass management. Exhibit four is a written comment from Atlantic Offshore Lobstermen Association. Uh, in support of the aggregate program rules. Exhibit five is a written comment from Mr. John Peabody uh, concerning commercial black sea bass management. So without further ado, let's go to the slides. So item one up for comment is to remove the provision that specifies quota management for Tatag over harvest as the summer period reference no longer exists in rule. Uh, so you can see the annotated regulations there. There is no longer a summer Tatog uh, quota period. Uh, Tatog was always handled if there was an overage, it would come out of the next year. As there's no more period the next year to take it from, uh, the notice regulations treat it like our other quota species. Are there any comments on item one? Yeah. Yeah, I, um, so this covers all species. So. I think the suggestion uh, would support the fact that instead of deducting it from the following year, the 
the wording would be subperiods that if there's an overfishing in a, in a subperiod, that it would be reconciled the following year for that same subperiod. We have a history of, of you know, if we allocate among subperiods, I used to talk, for example, this year, uh, we did away with the summer period and we went 50 50, but it never turns out to be 50 50. Uh, never did before the sea bass allocation similar. We overfish, and it's always the later in the year period that takes the hit to balance the equation. So I would, uh, I'll submit in writing, but uh, the commercial one really, that a sub period overfish is the tool we get handled on the dealer reporting to be able, and, and the mechan mechanism that will allow DEM to close a period when the quote is full and no longer. That we close it by, we alloc reallocate it the next year by sub period. Make up that balance. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Anyone else right along to talk? All right, item two is to establish a rule for a high grading prohibition. Basically, we are uh, putting into rule that you may not return a legal sized fish to the water after it's been taken into possession for the purposes of retaining another more desirable legal sized fish. Uh, we do have a, a provision in the rule as noticed to uh, exempt Tatar from this rule. Out. Yeah, how did enforcement weigh in on that? Uh, I, I can't, uh, I mean, I guess I can clarify that, that we did speak with them and they, they agree with uh, putting in a high grading rule. Um, they did. They, they, they were okay with the Tata prohibition, uh, making them exempt. So. Yeah, but how about like species like black sea bass? I mean, how are you gonna prevent that from happening if you make that a law? Their comment to us was that it would be difficult to enforce. So. Yeah, even if they board a boat and they get X amount of fish on board, how do they, they know what you're gonna do with them? It's almost to me like fruitful effort, but just an opinion. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you have a clear cut definition of what high grading is yet? Because like at the meeting, the enforcement is saying that they're going to have to use their discretion, but that seems to me like you could be opening up a lot of abuse of power with that. So this would be our definition to, to clarify. Uh, yeah. So it, it would be tied in with the definition of possession yeah. and their and their discretion, as they stated at the meeting. Yeah. So what could be definition? what could be like for one person might be different from another person as far as what's actually high grading then right well this this seems, this, this, yeah. this would be the notice definition of what the high you know with yeah, it seems making a prohibition more would be the clear definition. Cut definition of it before you put it in Sorry, what's your name again? Yep. james perkins that's right yeah please please identify with folks uh, Terry? Now, what happens if someone like me, Terrence Maloney, the fishing vessel Tiger Joe, um, at their discretion? Now, I've had agents come on the boat and tell me that they were ordered, if I was one pound over, that I was in violation. There was no discretion. And they told me that right to my face. I just got fined $6,500 because I played four fruit for dinner and eight fillets, and I was written up as a violation. Now, as it stands right now, fluke is 200 pounds a day, and there are no fluke in state waters to catch. I wouldn't even, that wouldn't even be a violation as it stands now, but as it was, it was at 50 pounds. Uh, so at, at their discretion, I don't stand a chance. I mean, when they come down and they say this stuff to me, I'm not making it up. I wouldn't come here and tell you a lie because then I would lose my credibility. This is what's been told to me. And you can go back and look at some of the violations that have been put on me. And they're not put on everyone else. And that's wrong. It's not selective prosecution. Um, I'm not, they're not finding hidden fish on my boat. I'm not doing anything sneaky or wrong. But when you get a severe violation for taking home dinner, there's something wrong with that. There's clearly got to be um, a difference between a violation and someone who has dinner. Um, so at that point, when you say high grading at their discretion, 
if, if the DEM come up to me in their rubber boat when I'm to the point making a drag and we just fall back and we've got 30 pounds bled out in a tot of water and it's, it's fish flopping around the deck, what happens to me then? It's their discretion. I could be in violation. I was in violation. They, they gave me a warning. I was inside the harbor refuge, not fishing, picking the deck because we made one drag and we had so many fish that that was it. I knew we had what we needed, so we just had the net all tied off and we're in there on our hands and knees picking for everything. Next thing you know, they're jumping on the boat and they looked and they said, oh, with that liner in the net, that's a violation. Well, I wasn't fishing. Now, I know now that they dropped the, the bag completely off the net and then put it back on in the morning, but um, it's just, when you make a law like that at their discretion, that's really, um, that's scary. It really is, it's scary. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm letting you know, because I'm just like, I'm doomed. Thank you. I really am. Any other comments on hydrating? Yeah, question. Did this come from DEM itself, or did this was this pushed by enforcement? Uh, so this this is a, just to clarify. This this rule is more to uh, be put in place to try to prohibit the practice of high grading, uh, specifically with an eye towards uh, incoming striped bass regulations for next year. But we uh, put it for all species. The division did. <coughs> Patrick. Yeah, Patrick, don't worry. Like I said, until they get some better language uh, at their discretion, that's that's not a good uh, that's not a good way because I mean anything could happen, you know, at their discretion. Just kind of kind of an open-ended book. Great. Oh uh, yeah, Greg for commercial fisherman. Maybe we have to distinguish between um, high grading and uh, discarding. I mean, you know, what, what is discarding? Is throwing a legal size fish over? I mean, no fisherman really has a crystal ball, so you, you know, if you make another tow, you haul another net, and some legal size fish are going to go over. It's just uh, sort of sort of like a murky area. What's discarding? What's high grading? I mean, uh, it just seems to me like. When you write stuff like this subject to interpretation, it's like it just you know we have enough enough regulations to follow already, and we just don't need to be overburdened with some wishy-washy stuff that could be taken either way just to create more regulations to make it more complicated. Thanks, John. How can enforcement really even apply this? Like they literally have to be standing on your boat watching you do it. Like they have to be right there. You have to have a tote, say you got your 50 pounds of sea bass in a tote, and you just, you're just hauling gill nuts, or you, you just, you know, you're pulling the bag in the boat, or whatever you're doing, you're pulling pots. They'd have to literally be watching, they'd have to be on the boat, <clears throat> physically watching you do something. I mean, there's really no mechanism for them to even know you're doing it at all, unless you have video surveillance or something on the boat. And furthermore, I mean, I suppose if you were dragging, and especially with the fish pot, and there's a there's definitely a chance to return those fish to the water alive, but most of the time when we're getting bigger sea bass and gill nets, unless they just hit the net, they're they're like freshly dead or pretty weak. Uh, sometimes when the water's cold, they're alive, but a lot of times they're dead. So I mean, you got swapping one dead fish for another one anyway. Um, I, I just don't see the sense in a law like this if you don't have a, 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 a functional mechanism to enforce it anyway. Like really, how is how would enforcement actually? monitor what you're doing on the deck of the boat as far as whether you swap <coughs> one fish out for another one. It would have to be right there. Or you'd have to have an observer on the boat that would observe it. I can see it you know, being used as, an, as, a, um, as a mechanism for this if you had an observer on every boat or something, but it doesn't make any sense because no, it, it, it's redundant. Thanks. Do you mind saying your name for the record? Uh, John Walker. Thanks. Yeah, I'd just like to make one comment. I don't like to see any new regulations put in place if the likelihood is that they can't be enforced. So all you're gonna have is guys that abide by the law, strictly by the law all the time to this. Everybody else is gonna keep high grade. So I would recommend that this shouldn't even be put in, to be honest with you. 
unless it just doesn't have the teeth in it that it could be enforced. So what's the sense of doing it? I mean, we've got enough regulations right now. I like the premise, you know, the premise sounds great on paper, but reality, I, I, I just, I would say not to have this even put in as a, a regulation. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Any other comments? <clears throat> All right, so item three, this has two slides. It's for uh, commercial management of black sea bass for 2020. Uh, for some considerations for management, uh, there have been no changes noticed uh, right now. Uh, so in 2020, we anticipate that our commercial quota is going to increase from 377,000 pounds to 613,000 pounds. So almost uh, doubled. And then just for reference, we have the current management scheme right now with all of the quota periods and their percentage uh, allocations. And uh, let me go to the next slide. So uh, we did have considerable discussion for this at the workshop. So we thought we would put the, uh, the, the, the larger items up here just for uh, maybe help you guide your comments. To be clear, these were uh, discussion. This was a discussion at the workshop and is not public current, uh, not public comment. Also, um, you know, I can only clarify things. I can't answer questions. So you have until November 29th. So if you want to give us a call, talk, talk this over, try to try to tease out something, you can still put a recommendation in writing up until the 29th. So just go through the workshop discussion. Uh, so one, the one item that was brought up was to perhaps, once again, these are all just discussion items. Uh, it was discussed that perhaps uh, to increase the May 1st to June 30th subperiod allocation percentage by decreasing allocation percentages from other subperiods. Another item for discussion uh, that perhaps to remove uh, the closed subperiod from August 1st to September 14th with allocation adjustments to other subperiods. However, it should be noticed that, noted that that is just a closed period right now. Um, there's no allocation in that period. Uh, the, another item that was discussed that perhaps we could increase the September 15th to October 30th subperiod allocation percentage by decreasing allocation percentages from other subperiods. And then uh, also discussed was to increase the November 31st, November 1st to December 31st. Oh, sorry. Can I see this one? In, increase uh, November 1st for December 31st subperiod allocation percentage by decreasing allocation percentages from other periods. Uh, we did have uh, one uh, industry proposal, alternate in industry proposal submitted, and that would be to increase the, no, the January 1st to April 30th possession limit to 750 pounds. Right now, it, it starts at 500 pounds per vessel. <laughs> Any comments on black sea bass management? John. Yeah, hey, I, I had missed the workshop, um, but this idea has been, been kicked around before. As a matter of fact, it was put forward last year, but it was attached to other um, ideas pertaining to other management mechanisms for the sea bass. But it, basically, I mean, I've discussed it with other fishermen and fishmongers alike, and the problem with the July opening is, I mean, we can catch the hell out of them everywhere. You, know, you can catch them, you guys catch them in lobster pots, you catch them, you catch them rod and reel, you catch them dragging, they're, they're all over the place. But you get these beautiful fish in the spring, you're getting 6, 650 a pound when it first starts, and 575, 550 towards the end of the spring. And then that July opening, the beginning of July, the market gets glutted around the 4th of July. The fishmongers are holding fish. They dump all those fish in the market. Then Massachusetts opens at 300 pounds a day, three days a week. And I mean, I don't think that um, you know, the fishmongers are completely innocent in all this either. They know that the market's going to be glutted, so they know they can put the screws to us on the price. But those same fish that we should be getting close to six bucks a pound for, we always end up getting 225, 250 for the jumbo fish. And the smaller fish, they're not even, they're not even worth anything. You know, by the time it's done, and that seemed to have happened at least the past couple years that I can remember. Um, and it just doesn't seem, I mean, it's not economical for the fishermen, and it seems like a waste of a resource, really. But a nice, I mean, I'm, I'm all for taking as many sea bass out of the ocean anyways, because they eat lobsters and, you know, they're, Populations exploding and displacing of the native fish and whatnot, but it, it seems like a waste of the resources in July, and it's kind of a catch-22. It's a shame because the, it's it's low-hanging fruit in July. They're easy to get for everyone, and the weather's fair and nice, and it's good to be out there. And it, you know, it's it's 
you know, like I said, it's kind of a catch-22, but it just doesn't make sense to have those things open when Massachusetts is open and destroying the market for them. So that being said, um, something along the lines of, you know, the, the first option there for increasing the, the May 1 through June 30th sub-period, you know, adding some of that, that summer fish onto that and then maybe adding some onto one of the other sub-periods and maybe doing away with the July opening altogether if we can't find a way to make the things, you know, more expensive in July, but I just don't see a way to do it. I'm sure there's, there are people that are gonna have hard feelings about that because, you know, that may be a good time for them in the season to go fishing, you know, maybe, um, you know, some of the guys, that's their only opportunity to really get them where they fish up the bay or, you know, the rod and reel guys can catch them real good when they're fluking or whatever, so there's bound to be some objections, but speaking from a strictly financial perspective, it seems like a real waste of resources to be taking those nice fish and getting a third of what you should be getting more. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to comment like with what he's saying, like we should move the July fish to different periods where they're actually going to be worth money and try and not have us overlapping with mass with the openings as much as possible. <coughs> So we can actually get paid for them. <coughs> Thank you. I'll go again and I'll go talk to you. Just a clarification, gentlemen. We had the workshop. We were we aware of the poundage increase in quota at that time? Uh, yes, yes, we were. Terry, then. Uh, the, could you back up one slide, Nicole, please? All right, now on that, you're saying that we're getting a 50% increase, right? Just now, about. why can't we just go to 100 pounds uh, per vessel per day if we're getting double the fish on each one of those periods? And what happens with the state boat only is when it hits November, it doesn't matter what the sea bass is per day per vessel because they're out of our reach. And um, if you add fish, sure. you do away with the July period and then add that into another period, um, it would have to be in that September to October because we can still catch fish then. But once it hits November and into uh, after that, same with the fluke, uh, we don't see them anymore. And depending on uh, severity of storms and how much the water gets riled up, uh, that makes the fish leave early also. So for a uh, state license holder only, all you're doing is catering to the people with federal permits that can fish outside of state water. Um, you know, I'm just, it's not fair to a state license holder only if you put it on the period where we don't have access to the fish. Thanks, Greg. Uh, just a point to note from this uh, chart here. Uh, let me just uh, preface my statement by saying that I'm a firm believer in weekly limits for everything. And uh, as a gillnet, what it allows you to do is like not waste fish. I mean, you know, if you if you set in a small batch and and you haul it and you have 200 sea bass for the day, 200 pounds, and the limit's 50, so you throw 150 over which, you know, a lot of them probably gonna die, and, and then you do that seven days a week, and you scratch your head, and this is a perfect example. You look at this chart, and this isn't the first year it's happened, because I, I mean, anecdotally, I know it seems to me like it happens a lot, and we scratch my head. So if you look from January 1st to April 30th, which basically is the time when we don't fish, there's no fish in state waters, and they have a weekly limit. It's 500 uh, pounds of vessel a week, and then all the other time periods, when they're in, it's just a daily limit, which in my opinion, just wastes fish. I mean, maybe we should at some point revisit this and say, uh, you, you know, and an example how you wouldn't waste fish is if you catch a sea bass and you, you catch them, you'd remove that gear and you wouldn't catch any more for the week. The same as you would do it for fluke, the same as you could do it with anything else. So it just, um, I, I mean, I'm not saying, so what I'm saying about this shot is I'm in favor of the weekly limits. Uh, it shows January 1st, April 30th, but I think they should apply to everybody, not just switch them back to a daily limit. It seems like they do it. I, I couldn't tell you how it started or, uh, or you know, I know it's been an effective book because I've noticed it, and so I just figured I'd, I'd say something about it. Thanks. James, I was gonna say, like, what he's saying about 
um, making sure the state water boats can do it. If you move it all to the May period, the state water boats certainly can catch them then. And then if the quota does go up, it would be open for July too. But just make it all one period, you know, so it pulls a couple of weeks. You get like, make sure to get all of June in or and maybe like move some of that to September when you can still get it in state waters too. But you could definitely eliminate the July opening and still have it so state water boats would benefit. Thanks. John? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, a combination of what I said earlier with, with the elimination of that July opening so you get the better value for the fish and maybe moving that stuff into the May period. And also what this gentleman over here said about if, if we're, we're going to be doubling our quota for next year um, and possibly moving some out of the July, there's no reason why it can't be 100 pounds a day from, from May 1st. And then, you know, hopefully moving towards getting an aggregate weekly limit for the black sea bass and everything else for, for all fishermen. But I mean, in the meantime, if, if you were to, if we get a double quota anyways, if you were to move that 19% into the May opening, or maybe we split it between like the, the May and the September opening, um, there's, there's no reason why it couldn't be 175 pounds a day right from the get-go, and we'd get good money for all those fish. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, personally, I'm in favor of eliminating that January to April sub-period altogether. Uh, as it's already been stated here, the inshore fishermen, state fishermen, that does absolutely no good at all. The only people that benefit from that are the people offshore, and those guys aren't in the same financial situation that the inshore fishermen are in. So I would say take that allocation and spread it through the other sub-periods. Like John said, maybe the uh, spring one and the fall one, <clears throat> just because of the price, but at least my personal opinion would be to eliminate that that's always irked me. You know, when we can't catch the fish anymore, they've already gone, migrated, they're allowed to get 500 pounds a week. To me, that's always been ridiculous. You know, they're out there catching all those jumbles with a lot of money. You know, I've fished offshore for years and years. Nothing against those guys, they work hard, but they're not in the same financial situation that inshore fishermen are in the state of Rhode Island. Simple as that. Let the inshore fishermen have a chance to catch a few more fish during those other sub periods. That's my opinion. <coughs> Thanks. Anyone else for sea bass? John, one more? Yeah, just one more comment. You know, you know, all of these things come into light with um, us getting more fish, you know, realizing that some of the quota is inaccessible to some of the state licensed fishermen, and realizing that some of the quota is, is placed in times of the year where the fish are invaluable. If you put all those considerations together and come up with a proper management plan for these fish, you could, we could actually end up with a directed sea bass fishery in Rhode Island, sort of like what Massachusetts has, where it's not a bycatch fishery, it's actually something where you can go out and set 50 pots and actually make a paycheck every week, a decent paycheck, fishing for black sea bass like the guys up in Massachusetts do. If we moved it around, if we moved the quota around correctly, and keeping in mind the fact that we're going to have twice as much as we've had. You know, if we could, if we could get it, you could take 100 pounds a day in the spring and in the fall for you know two or three weeks in the open. You could make a little bit of money off of them, and it would, and it would, it would no longer be a a, a bycatch or um, you know multi-species type boat fishery like it is now. So I mean, that being that being taken into consideration, I mean that should be written down that you, you could, it could be a directed fishery. Thanks. Patrick? Patrick Duckworth. I agree with what Al says about getting rid of January to April. Massachusetts, like John said, they don't have a winter period. It's only open during the, during the spring, summer, and fall. I mean, that's a lot of those uh, fish are really not, uh, they're not going to make a difference, guys. I mean, that's pretty much how I see it. The web, the, uh, the people that fish state water, the state fishermen, inshore fishery that could actually use that extra 500 pounds, spread it out to a lot more people, get, get a lot more landings. I think that's a, it's just a little icing on the cake for that. I mean, that could be some of bread and butter in that, you know? Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to David first since yeah. he isn't coming. Yeah, David, <coughs> uh, Atlantic Offshore. 
Uh, I basically support the distribution as it is, um, but I think that uh, I agree with the suggestion that was made about combining May 1st through you know, July 31st. That's 45% of the quota, and if you increase that by 58%, which is what the, the, the our allocation is going to go up, that's the most lucrative time of year for the fishermen in this room to catch those fish. The jumbos are going for 575. As soon as you get to the point where uh, mass opens on, on uh, at the end of July, this year the price went down to $1.75 for jumbos. It's just the point that was the gentleman behind me made is dead on. If you want to maximize the dollars for the industry, you should combine those two periods. And, and potentially bump up the, the actual triple limit. You could probably go to 60 pounds or 70 pounds and still have it run that entire period, which would be desirable. If you get rid of the January through April period, all you're going to do is enhance the discard. So the dis those basically bycatch fisheries that take place at that time of year in the pot fishery and the trawl fishery. Any of the observers that are on the boat are going to note the discards. Those discards come off the quota the following year. But that doesn't do anybody any good. Thank you. I'm going to go over Craig. Just a quick comment to make, too, about uh, making fish available for the steak eyes. Uh, the same thing happened with fluke this year. So they opened fluke at 50 pounds. Uh, when the with fluke were around, we were catching 100 or 200. You did scotting three quarters of your catch to limit yourself to 50 pounds a day. And now, when there's no more fluke in state waters, they're all outside and we're getting the emails that the fluke limits uh, 200 or 250 pounds a day if you have an exemption. And like the state guys are scratching their heads saying, Jesus, I wish we had had started out with 100 pounds. I could have made some money rather than basically we, we sort of missed our opportunity. So the same thing. Could, you know, across the board, it can happen with other species, and it wouldn't just be sea bass because it's happening with fluke right now. Thank you, John. I just wanted to go on the record because I, I had said that um, I supported getting rid of that July opening, but I also do support Al's option of um, also doing something with the January third, January first, April thirtieth opening. If not, if not getting rid of it completely, maybe um, taking some of it or just changing the way it's structured or something. Definitely, I support that as well. I just want that on record. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Ken Booth, Commercial Rod and Reel. Uh, I can understand what's being said. I think. However, uh, we're getting pretty much a third of an increase in this, not 50% uh, in quota. But if the same allocation as the pound, it goes up reasonably within each period. But we still need a summer fishery. Uh, you know, we don't have. August to September 14th. So if the concern is, and I'm looking, the mass season opens on the 9th of uh, July for parters. Um, hook and line the 9th, mobile gear the 9th. Um, so whether we close July and move some to August, early September, and still keep the uh, viable fishery there. Thanks. Yeah. I just want to go on the record also say that um, it always opens on the 9th, but we still always end up getting screwed because we get the fish get glutted up on the 4th of July weekend, and the fish brokers always use the mass opening and the 4th of July weekend as an excuse to, to gouge the price of the fish. Yeah. I, I, it seems like it shouldn't be a problem. You, you would think in you know, reasonable economic terms, you could look at it and say, oh, the price should be good all the way up until the 9th. But you know, that's American capitalism for you. They know that they can do it, and they do it, and we end up getting paid very little money for the fish here regardless. All right, thanks. See no more other comments? Oh, no oh sorry, I can see. Uh, I understand about the January to April closure and create discard. If we're worried about the discard, it's a lot more in the summer. I know there's a there's a ton of this kind of all summer long. So I mean, I don't know, it's a slippery slope. I mean, myself, August and September, we drove a sea bass that whole time, very thick, but you all saw. 
So I mean, it's uh, I mean, I don't want to take any food off anyone's plate, but I mean, the little guy has got to survive. Stay the only guy that to survive. This is like the one of fisheries that they could. I mean, August through September, I don't know. Look at the prices or something. Try to give them guys a little fish somewhere in there, because I mean, there's a, there are a lot of them around, and you know, want to help out a little bit. Thank you. Sir. If you look around the room, there are no federal fishermen here. You have to have everything you want. There is no need for them to come. The people that really come on these fish um, are here and they're trying to get more of it. Um, thank you. Sure. Sante, Fish and Vessel Oceana. Um, yeah, I would I agree with Kip that there was some way we could get some fish in August through September of that period because we're catching them. And we're the them. Um, it would be nice mm -hmm. to be able to keep some fish on that time. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else for sea bass? All right, so item four is uh, 2020 commercial management of SCUP. Uh, no changes have been noticed. Uh, no proposals uh, have been received. Uh, and just for reference, that is our current management. We don't expect uh, many changes for SCUP this year. Any comments for SCUP? Seeing none. Uh, item five this is another two slider. Uh, this is for 2020 commercial management of summer flounder. Uh, so there are some notice changes that have been proposed. First is to increase the starting possession limit during the May 1st to September 15th subperiod to 50, from 50 to 100 pounds per vessel day. The second one that was noticed is to open the summer flounder aggregate landing program on the Saturday of the first full week in January instead of the Sunday of the first full week in February and amend the starting opening possession limit for the summer flounder aggregate landing program from 1,500 pounds per bi-week to 2,000 pounds per bi-week. And you can see below that this is the notice changed and that's the annotated right there to go up to 2,000 bi-week and 100 uh, per day in the May period. We did receive a alternative industry proposal uh, from the town dock, and this was to increase the starting possession limit during the May 1st to September 15th subperiod from 50 to 100 pounds per vessel day, and to amend the, the starting slash opening possession limit for the summer flounder aggregate landing program from 1,500 pounds per bi week to 1,500 pounds per week. So the, the difference between the two is uh, the noticed the noticed uh, proposal was 2,000 pounds per bi week. The industry proposal is 1,500 pounds per week. Any comments on summer flounder management, Patrick? Uh, I definitely like to see it open at 100. And uh, <coughs> the town dock one, is that right? That it would change to 1,500 per week. So that'd be 3,000 by week. Is that correct? That would, it would be go to a weekly instead of a bi weekly. So. Well, I mean, like I said, I'm in favor of weekly aggregates. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that they got definitely got a lot more fish by that. I'd be afraid that they're going to run that 54% over real quick if they go to 3,000 compared to 1,500. I mean, and they open it up January 1st, which usually doesn't open up till February 1st. What is it, the second week of February? Correct. Usually, Currently, so they'll yes. spend a month earlier doubling their fish. No, two separate ones, Patrick. Well, well, he was asking what their current one is. No, because the town dock one says it wants to open up. The town dock one doesn't say it wants to open up the first Saturday of January, correct? Yeah, the, both the notice and the town dock uh, have to open the in the in January instead of February. The current rule is for the second week of February. Okay, so currently, so they can, so it's gaining a whole month on the weekly aggregate, on the weekly, on the fluke exemption, 
weekly period or whatever you want to call it. And they're not going to go bi-weekly, they're going to go single weekly. So they get a 3,000 instead of the 2,000. They open an extra month early. I'm just afraid that 54% is going to burn up real quick and they're going to have a huge overage, you know, and then hit us in the summer, which that's what I'm afraid of. Thanks. John? I, I had a question and a comment. One, um, are we getting more flu quarter this year? And if so, how much are we getting? So we got more fluke last year. We didn't get it uh, as, you know, right at the beginning of the year. It, it, we knew we were going to get more. We didn't know how much it was. It came in a little bit later than we knew. So that's why we kind of ramped things up as the year went on. All right, so how, about how, much, how much more did they give us this year? Uh, it's the same as last year. I don't have that exact number from me right now. All right, so we're expecting next year to be the same amount of quota as we had this season? Correct. Um, I am going to have to try to support with what Pat was saying on that. Um, I mean, this is a pro. This proposal came from Town Doc. Uh, the alternate industry proposal, correct? I mean, to go back to what we were talking about with the with the sea bass, um, that seems like a, a proposal that's really skewed <coughs> towards guys that are harvesting fish outside state waters um, when when it's inaccessible to state waters fishermen. And um, if we're not getting a a hefty increase in the uh, in the quota, it would seem like they would eat up that 54% pretty quickly if they got an extra month and they basically doubled what they could take a month because they'd be taking twice as much per month if you guys make it 1,500 pounds per week rather than bi-weekly. So they'd be taking yeah. twice as much per month during the time it's open and adding a month of that onto that. So there's, there is definitely an opportunity for them to go over on that. Over on the quota, it just doesn't seem. I mean, it just doesn't seem to make sense for the for the smaller boats in shore. It's certainly not help. Certainly not help the state water fishing in any. Thank you. Let me go to Terry, Ken, and James. On the previous slide, when it was uh, an increase from fifteen hundred or whatever it was fourteen fifty to the two thousand, uh, to fifteen hundred. Well, then it should just be a thousand per week, and leave the bottom one with the increase of the 100 pounds per vessel per day from May 1st until the end of the year. Uh, and on that, uh, towards the end of the year, once it hits November 1st anyways, um, as far as the state boat goes anyways, they're not going to be landing that 100 pounds because the fish are born. So whatever is not captured by then, that can be carried over for the start of January because of their landing and increase of fish. It's, um, that, that's the perfect world. Because once, once the fish are gone, it doesn't matter how many pounds it is, we're not gonna catch them. And then it's all geared for the federal boat that's fishing outside and the boat that have the exemption certificate. So, like they were saying, you're giving them, if they were to go to um, the 1500 per week, that, that's quite an increase. But at the 2000, just go give them a thousand pounds each week. Um, and then that would, because it is a month earlier, that would just stretch the fish right out. And then they would always be counting on whatever we didn't catch after November. Um, they, they're getting, you know, uh, 40 days of fish that a state boat isn't having a chance to catch that could be added on to what they're starting with anyway. Does that work that way? Whatever it is an opted, can it get carried over or is it going forever? Uh, we can't carry over uh, yeah, over, the over the year. Year. It doesn't start like uh, like the federal May for us to, make, to, to the end of April? No, we we're on the calendar year. Oh, we, so. we are on the calendar year. <clears throat> well, the federal boat is still going to be able to catch that fish anyways, it's just that they're out of our reach. I mean, we, you know, if we get 30, 40 pounds per day right now, you know, you, you did all right. But to give them 3,000 pounds or 1,500 each week, uh, I think that would gobble up a lot of those fish like this gentleman over here would say. But if you have the 2,000 up there, you just give them 1,000 pounds each week. Uh, they're still doing all right. The price should be pretty good. Um, 
And what we're looking at is that that looks really nice because he found per vessel per day from May 1st until the end of the year, as far as I'm looking at it. Thanks. Ken? Hey, John, a quick question clarification. We're talking seven day a week at 100 pounds a day? Ah, uh, yeah, seven days a day. So, uh, it's the Patrick's point, the, it goes back to the first slide in the presentation. If you make a sub period accountable for their overage the following year, there's no penalty coming out of it. I, I personally, the guys that fish that January and April 30th, whether they catch them in you know five weeks or ten weeks, as long as they don't go over where it affects the summer and you know and winter too, it doesn't really bother me. As, as long as they're accountable for their overage and it doesn't get passed on to the guys who fish May 1st and have to, have to get taken away. So I think that's where that first slide becomes important to adjust that if that capability is there. Because, and again, as Patrick said, they will get, or Terry said, they'll get the back end of the winter two season that isn't caught. They won't get that because they can't carry it over. So that's lost forever. Thanks. James, John, and Pat. Can the, the limits can get adjusted, like if you think the quota is going to get caught up or something, right? So this isn't, because I, I just have concerns about um, them taking too much from the summer period. I mean, from, you know, from the May to September period, if you have it that high. Thanks. Uh, John? Yeah. Um, <coughs> So just to, I had a, another question. Did the um, the first one they had up there <clears throat> where they wanted to do the uh, 1,500 pounds weekly for the uh, for the winter aggregate? This was this was the industry proposal number one for <coughs> town dock. They were also proposing the uh, 100 pounds a day May 1st through September 15th. And now you've got this this other proposal up there where it's 2,000 pounds bi-weekly. Um, still including the full January opening rather than opening in February. That looks um, a little more palatable and seems a little more fair to, to both sides of the fishery, to the inshore guys and giving the offshore guys a little bit more, I guess. My question is, um, you guys had said that we, we did get more, more fish. Uh, it was added on late in the year. Obviously, we all saw the fluke limits going up and up and up throughout the summer and the fall. Um, did the department run the numbers to see if that 100 pounds a day, seven days a week, would probably work with the, the current model we have right now? Yeah, we have. They they have done the projections for these, trying to trying to get it to, you know, basically start and finish it on, you know, no balance. So. I mean, if that 100 pounds a day would work, I mean, that's that would be great. Um, and I guess the 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 second option would be 2,000 pounds bi-weekly. But giving them the extra month in January is certainly more favorable to giving them January and giving them 1,500 a week. Um, it, it certainly seems like you, you guys would you guys would see the, the trigger coming a lot sooner if you were to go with the second option rather than rather than the um, 1,500 pounds a week. Thank you, Patrick and Bob. And. Uh, don't forget about the January to April period. Anyone that uh, is in this pilot program gets that 1,500 pounds. So you have many other people. All they have to do is go on a boat with a federal food permit, and you're going to have a lot more increase in the winter period because all you got to do is get this, anyone that's running because the uh, <coughs> pilot program goes with your state license, so that means they can go on any boat that doesn't have a food exemption and run it, run it as long as they have a federal food permit, and they can take part in 1500. Just to clarify, Patrick, the aggregate pilot is for the vessel captain combo, so the, the captain has to be on, on the boat, that's declared, but that's just to clarify. Well, I'm just saying all they got to do is just get somebody that has a list them as a captain. I'm just saying there could potentially be another 20. 20 participants in a one-year period is to be open in January period. Thank you. Thanks. Well, <coughs> Massachusetts is 300 a, a, a day. Uh, you know, uh, they seem to handle pretty good. Uh, I personally, totally, <laughs> the 
ideas to scream about the fact that eggs mean everything. And if you can put billions of eggs in the water, we're going to have a lot more fish. Especially clean water, like the offshore water. The inshore farmers are taking a beating. You can all see that. It's a problem with pollution. You get some chance of it offshore with a fluke. And to have 54% taken during the period of spawning is so ridiculous. Uh, it, that, you know, it all started, that's how they went out there on the edge, the 100 fathom, they all congregated to spawn, and that's when they caught it, and they ruined the fisheries. And here we are giving it back to them again. Uh, we should at least be taking a fair share of the quota. We should have, you know, an equal box, 12 times a year, the same amount of fish, or take 10% right now, right off of the winter quota, but they're spawning, number one. Number two, put it into the summer quota, May to September, and give us 150 pounds. And bring back the fish, let them spawn. Anyone else for summer plumbing? Right. <clears throat> All right, number six is 2020 commercial management of bluefish. So some considerations, the 2020 com commercial quota is 188,637 pounds, which is similar to 2019. However, it should be noted that there, there will not be a quota transfer from the recreational fishery in 2020. That usually gives us a boost each year, so we will just be held to that quota, so it, there will be less fish to fish on initially. Uh, we do have some notice, cha uh, some notice changes that have been proposed. Uh, first is to increase the minimum size from 12 inches to 18 inches. Second is to decrease the starting possession limit during the May 1st to November sub-period from 8,000 to 6,000 pounds per vessel day. And you can see those annotated right there. Any comments on commercial bluefish? James, then David. What if the 6,000, do they think it's going to stay open the whole time? Or as far as like running the numbers with their projections? Uh, to clarify, the department did do some projections, and that's where the 6,000 pounds. So that's like the maximum they think they can keep it open at? It, it's a projection. Yeah, well, I definitely want to support whoever doesn't close it. Dave? No, you answered the question, but I just point out to everybody that commercial quota is going down by 64%. So I think it's important. I don't fish for bluefish or represent anybody uh, on bluefish, but I think it's important to lower it enough so that you don't close it. In other words, just keep it open so the guys can keep going. Anyone else for bluefish? Dean? Yeah, I think it's important to get to that 18 inch size limit because uh, that is when they are 100% sexually mature. So you wouldn't be taking fish that didn't have the opportunity to reproduce if you kept it. If you kept it at the 18 or brought it up to the 18, then all the fish would have the opportunity to reproduce, which is just common sense. Good fisheries management, I think. Let fish reproduce before you take them. Um, so that I think is very important to get to that. Thank you, John. If, right. if um, correct me if I'm wrong, but haven't we over the past couple of years gone back and forth with the, the minimum size on the bluefish? It has changed back. It's gone smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger. It's gone between 12 and 18. Why was it ever so small? Wasn't there like some small fish fishery or some particular buyer that wanted the smaller fish and there was a market for them so there were a couple of fishermen that were concerned about being able to fill that market or was, wasn't there something like that brought up maybe last year? I, I don't go into too much detail but to clarify it's because also, it's also a bycatch issue with some of the floating fish trap catches. But the point I was making is that there's really not a great market for a smaller fish than, I mean, if there is a good market for it, then, then I mean, if it's a historical market, then maybe, you know, we should be apprehensive of, of 
closing that market by raising the size of the fish. But if there really isn't a great market for it and there's not a lot of value in it, then yeah, absolutely, then, then raise the size of the fish so they can reach sexual maturity before they get harvested and, and continue to, to replenish the stock. That's, that's all I'd, I'd say. Thanks. So okay. What difference does the market make if uh, <coughs> the fish is not sexual, if the fish is too small to be taking it, it's not sustainable for the stock to be taking the fish? I mean, I think you gotta make sure raise the size limit to a point where they can reproduce so that the fish are still there in the future. Thanks. Greg? Sorry. Yeah, I also agree. Uh, I fish on bluefish and I agree that the limit should, uh, the size limit should be 18. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's ridiculous to take them yeah. below that size if they didn't have a chance to reproduce yet. I mean, like that other guy said, it doesn't really concern you. The market, you know, let the markets just happen, but limited experience I have with the market, the guy that was selling out fish to, they're always big fish, and he's always complaining about he has a chance to buy small fish from the south, and, and uh, uh, he doesn't get any yield from them, and he, and he hates doing it. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's my input. I would be in favor of the larger fish. Thanks. Steve? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been my experience with fish with bluefish a long time. The, the larger fish, the uh, a better, there's a better market for the larger fish more valuable. Um, and as far as the bycatch with the traps, the nice thing about that trap fishery is the fish are normally still alive. So if they have to discard them, at least they're going back overboard alive. I agree with it. Raise it to 18 inches. Let them get fully sexual mature. Keep them premature. It's not good. Any other comments for bluefish? All right, so item seven is 2020 commercial management of Menhaden. Uh, right now, the division is not pro proposing any management changes for 2020. Uh, 2020 commercial quota is anticipated to be similar to 2019, and that's at 2.4 million pounds. Any comments for commercial Menhaden? John. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I don't really know, even know if, if this comment has anything to do with the quota, but it would seem like the way that they um, measure our quota and measure how much fish we have here needs to, needs to be looked at. Because I mean, we, we did end up with an awful lot of Menhaden in the bay this year, and the management area never opened. I mean, there were definitely fish. I mean, because we saw them all coming out in the fall. You may not have seen them all go in. They, maybe they went into the smaller schools and congregated up the bay, but they definitely they definitely were there. This fall, I mean, tons of them came out. Uh, but the, the area never opened, so I mean, nobody nobody ever got to fish in the management area when the fish were easy to catch. I'm not sure if anybody really fished on them outside the management area. Um, but that was just an observation that I made. I, I was working with a buddy of mine who had come down to go to go purseing and then wasn't able to do well because the fish were in the management area and he couldn't go get them. And, were able to get them outside the management area, and um, you know, usually when they when guys are harvesting them around here, it makes it their local it makes it a lot easier for the local lobstermen to get fresh bait. Um, I just think that something needs to be done, you know, looking into whatever they're doing with the flights or the observers or the spotters, whatever you want to call them, to try to you know quantify how much fish is coming in. Um, I guess they, they just need to try to do a better job at it. They, they were definitely there. Thanks. Bob? It's kind of unfortunate that the whole plan started parallel. Number one, <coughs> whatever those fish landed on is where they got their quota from. So here we had them working Narragansett Bay, going to Fort River. Therefore, Massachusetts got all the big quota. It should have been where the fish were harvested. That's where the quota should be change that and, and use that. Uh, now, they don't even get the fill ever. I think it's been five years now, the Massachusetts quota, because they've got such a large quota, because they all went to Fort River. It didn't go with the, a, a new port of one Cuba. But the fish came out of that against the bay. So it was really screwed. Thanks. Any other men hitting comments?
right, so number eight is uh, a proposed prohibition of ocean pout in state waters. Uh, the consideration here is it would just sync up with the federal rule, uh, which uh, prohibits the harvest and possession of ocean pout. We are not compelled to do this. Hopefully. Any comments on ocean pout? All right. Similar to ocean pout, uh, we, we have a proposed uh, prohibition on Atlantic wolffish. Uh, once again, this would sync us up with state and federal rules, uh, which ban uh, the harvest and possession of wolffish in federal waters. Any comments on wolffish? Okay, item 10 is uh, for the Part 12 Research Pilot Aggregate Program. This is a proposal to extend the program through 2021, so that's two more years of uh, fishing. Uh, the notice changes as proposed would reduce the eligibility requirements for historical record of landing summer flounder from five, summer flounder and black sea bass from five years to one year. The second one would be to propose to increase the number of participating vessels in the program from three to six per year category, so we, if, if uh, we take new applicants. Number three would be to uh, amend the application period from, from no later than November 30th, 2018, where it sits currently, to between January and March 30th annually as the program is being run. And as I said, it would also extend the program. Any comments on the aggregate pilot program? Um, okay, so the people, uh, well, it's no secret, I'm in favor of weekly landings for everything, whether you call it aggregate, it, it, it's good, it prevents waste, uh, maximizes efficiency. So that being said, I think it's a good thing I wasn't involved in it. I know the guys that are in it love it. Uh, in favor of increasing the number of vessels, but with a caveat that if you can't, I mean, fear is fear. I mean, well, the vessels that were already in it, maybe you know give a new group of vessels a shot so in other words if you know uh, my first option would be yes increase it get new vessels in there but if they can't do that if something happens then to say okay well we'll go to strategy two which will be you know the uh, first line of forces that already went through there they already had a turn because i'm sure there's a bunch of other guys that want to have a turn and then for the third year of the program the same thing and probably make a better science spread it out better get better uh, things but so my, my first choice would be to increase the program to let more people in, but that being said, if you can't do that, maybe you know, change the participants around, you know, be a little fear for everyone, probably get better science. Thank you. I'm gonna go, did you have one, John? Oh, I, I was just gonna say, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with um, extended through 2021, certainly um, no objections to, uh, change it in the application period to make it easier for people to apply or make it um, to make people more aware that, that it's available. I know um, last year when we all sat down to the meeting to hash it out, we were sitting there at an empty table because no one applied. And this year, you know, there's a bunch of guys crying that they weren't in it. it where, I mean, there were open slots last year that people didn't even apply for and you know, the department went through the usual channels that they go through to advertise just like they would for anything else, any, any other research program or any other type of meeting, any other type of management changes or anything, it was the same. There, it was no secret. It went out the way everything else goes out. Um, I mean, I would say, yeah, sure, make it, uh, make the application period a little bit longer, make it easier for more people to get in. I would say definitely increase the fleet. Um, that's certainly gonna help, gonna help with the science. Um, I think a little more participation in it will definitely uh, make your averages look a little better. Maybe you're going to get more accurate numbers. Um, I mean, I hate to sound biased here, but you know, from a scientific perspective, I would say booing the people out that you've already got metrics on and getting a whole new group of people in there probably wouldn't be good for science because um, you're throwing your control group out. You, I mean, the, the idea of science is gathering information over a long period of time and you try to keep as many control factors as you can. So, um, but I, I mean, eventually I'm, I want everybody in it. I mean, it makes sense. It, 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 it makes a lot more sense for everyone. It makes sense for the fish, makes sense for the environment, makes sense for the fishermen, uh, financially and everything. It's a, I'd love to see this whole thing succeed and get everyone in it eventually. 
Thanks. Did you have one there? Uh, I was just supporting what this guy said um, about allowing more people into it, you know, or possibly giving someone else a chance because, uh, you know, it goes from being a, a bycatch fishery to uh, something to actually target and work on. Thanks. Do you mind saying your name? Russell Sylvester. Thanks. And then with Terry, that was Bob. Well, I agree with, agree with what Greg is saying, and I attended a meeting where they showed the uh, graph on uh, the participation and the effort put forward. And there were people in there that didn't put much effort forward for whatever reason it was. And then there are other people that, that were off the chart. So uh, if these people are in it and not putting an effort, or someone else should have a shot at it where they might want to get a run at it and show more effort. So if you're not going to increase more people into the program, then the people that I'm putting in effort uh, that are in it right now, they should be uh, removed and someone else should fill their shoes. That's, that's my feeling. And you've had good science. Thank you. Bob? Yes, it is sort of like a special class that you formed here. You know, it should have been that everyone should have been able to have this. You know, I don't know why it couldn't be. Um, we're saying it, and I, he said it. I agree with them all uh, that everyone should be doing this, not just this selected group of special people, and especially give another guy a chance if they're going to keep up with. I think for the data purposes, you're getting the same data from me that you're getting from them. There is what is this extra data that you're getting? There is none that I can see that you're getting. I'm giving it to you, they're giving it to you. Unless you haven't driven around the boat and watched all the bycatch and what's going on, then I say, okay, then all right, you're getting some data that you, you really need. Have an observer there all the time, fine. But that's not the case. I don't think you haven't driven once on that boat. But that's whatever. Bottom line is it should have been for everybody, not just a selective group. And it should be shared. It's going to be just with the special people, well, let a special other person get a chance at it. Thank you. Pat? I agree with what Greg says, let more participants in, and make a lot, a lot more uh, well known. I mean, I try to keep up on it, I try to keep up on when this stuff goes on and stuff. I didn't even hear about it personally. I mean, I fish hard, I, I'll fish in, next thing I know, I already missed some. Cut off the same thing with happened with sea bass research. I mean, it should be hand in hand. Either, in my, in my personal opinion, open it up for everybody or shut it down. That's just how I agree. I mean, because you're always going to have, if you increase three more boats, make it six participants per gear category, then you're gonna have, it's always, that's only six people. You know, either have it wide open or have it not. And to participate, and I understand what he's saying, the science, but the science, you, you control there. Okay, so just let me uh, <coughs> say this for, let me just think about this for a second. So just say you took part in it this year. You say, oh, God, all right. I never really caught food in this time and that time, you know. So let me see. I'm going to go rehang. 50 nets where you tradition because this is supposed to just be traditional fishing it's not supposed to be pig pen fishing and then all of a sudden you know go fluking for two days and then take the rest of the week off it's supposed to, all this was made was so you could fish you could fish and catch it all you could fish during the week in traditional fishing efforts that if you look at some of the people's efforts down here the, the guy was here and the next thing you know he's off the chart if you look at that graph, you're going to think, Jesus Christ, if everyone knows that, we're going to have a problem. And you're going to shut it down anyways. You know, because then that person, then the following year, the guy goes, so then the following year, he gets more gear built, or he gets, or he trades in his lobster boat, gets a dragger, and he goes dragging every day and gets this fluke, and you're going to say, wow, his participation went through the roof. You know, that's what I mean, you kind of got to, you, you want to have the most modest participants as at all. I think they should just run the thing for a whole year and see what ends up happening. If the food fishery shuts down, it shuts down. If it doesn't, all right. In my eyes, I mean, that's just how I feel about it. I mean, it's going to be 
Hard feelings no matter what. You have three, six, 25 volts in it. There's always gonna be the 26th person that's gonna be, that's gonna be, it's not fair for it. So open it up to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Terry? I agree with Patrick with what he was saying because I dock on the same dock with one of the participants and uh, he's definitely putting, uh, he's re-rigging just, just to target that because uh, as, as it is now with the 200 a day, which is 1400 for the week, um, he's definitely changed his style of fishing just to do that fishery. Uh, and I don't know if that was the way it started out or if it was just to let them fish normally but having this aggregate to see what the potential would be. Uh, and I didn't even realize it, but now that he brought that up, is um, was that what it was about? Was it for people to re-rig and just go charging right after these fish or was it for them to fish normally and see how it worked out? Just to clarify, they can fish however they like to in response oh, to being However you like, as long as you get into the program. All right. Well, good to him. Great. Uh, well, just to notice, so an observation, what I can see from before this pilot program started, uh, when the flu equipment opens uh, and it's 50 pounds a day, and, you know, basically it's a, uh, it's a bycatch fishery. We're trying to avoid the flu. You're trying not to get... Uh, two or three hundred pounds certainly wouldn't even think about setting a fluke yet because you know you have 500 or a thousand pounds of fluke um, so what you're doing is you're trying to avoid them and uh, you know bycatch fishery for your large mesh monkey yeah, maybe you know you catch 100 or 200 pounds and you bring in 50 certainly wouldn't even dream about setting any fluke yet because you'd be way over and that's that's how it was for all license holders so now how the dynamics change is you and, um, and I'm with Patrick. I sort of I, I try to attend all these meetings, but I missed it. So uh, bad me. I missed, missed the application. But what what it did is it took a handful of people for the pilot program. I don't know if it meant to do it, and like gave them permission to target fish instead of avoid them. So you have 99. I don't know what percentage that is. So basically, have 99.8 percent of the industry trying to avoid the fluke, uh, not to catch them. To, uh, to keep the bycatch to a minimum, and this program, whether it meant to do it or not, is basically people redefining their business to say, oh, well, I can when the limits go up, 1,500 pounds, I'm going to go out and catch 700. Uh, before, to say, for example, even because of, you know, I know people that do it, and the, the weeks were back to back. So from just say, say uh, Sunday, the week starts on Sunday. So just say Friday and Saturday is a different week. So they catch 700 Friday, 700 Saturday, 700 Sunday, 700 Monday, and then they take their fluke gear out. And it, it's just it, it's just bizarre that it you know everyone else is trying. I'm you know I'm sitting here trying to avoid fluke, so I don't get arrested coming in with more than 50 pounds a day in, in spring. And now you've spawned this whole other people that are rehanging gear for fluke gear that never really you know went fluke before to to catch 700 a day for four days in a row or with the limits were up or you know some some high limits which it's uh yeah it, it's just bizarre because i mean we all have the same license we all have the state multi-purpose license we all have fluke landings i mean come on and, uh, and one other thing that i'm really going to tell you right now that burned my ass was excuse my language was so I don't have a fluke exemption. I haven't been able, I haven't had the financial ability to buy one yet. But so fluke goes to 250. Okay, now we all have the same state license. Now they should put some type of cap on these because they still get the, you can land over. I can't come up with more than 200 pounds of fluke. But as soon as you get this pilot program, he can come up with, they can come up with whatever they want. Without an exemption. Yeah. So now the other day, like a perfect example, last week I fished five days last week. Okay, I fished five days. And I could have my 250 every day. I threw over another 300. This person sitting next to me comes down, sets his gear on me, pretty much two mics from me, sucks up all the fluke. I'm throwing him over, he's smiling, loading his boat up, steams right by me. I come in, I'm at the dock worried that I might have 201 pounds. And, then the, and this, then the next day, we steam out. 
goes right next to me and does the same thing because we fish Saturday and so he fished Saturday, the person fishes Saturday, and they fish Sunday. So here I am throwing over my fish all day. Keep my 200, I could have had an extra 50, than the 250, but I don't have an exemption. You know, so I don't know how this, the research pilot program got around the exemption. I'm very boggled by that, because, and I'm surprised, honestly, anyone that has a food exemption really was even in favor for the pilot program doing that because I mean it, it's cost me it's gonna cost me seventy five grand to get food retention. And I don't know unless we're gonna do away with the food exemptions. I thought that was on the I thought that was on the what's it called tonight? The public hearing was about what we were gonna do to the food exemptions about uh the, they were gonna say the numbers and stuff, you know. I mean, I think this thing is great once we take care of the fluke exemption first and the pilot program. Right now you got the pilot program and the fluke exemption. You know, that's how I feel about it. Thanks. Ken? Ken Booth, uh, Commercial Rod Reel. You go, you go back to, uh, to the points that have been brought up, the development of the pilot program, is what concerns that were raised at that time, and I think it would be appropriate instead of looking now at making a change out of here with no data that the DEM hold a workshop to bring these points back in because it was supposed to be a program where if a fisherman goes out and he gets on the fish, he can keep them rather than throwing them back. But if it's turned into a target fishery, that is, as it's been brought up, that kind of changed the whole dynamic of it as to what it could support. So I don't know if the statistically, if you're achieving the numbers and the data that you were looking for originally, because it was supposed to be, if I'm out fishing and I end up with uh, a good day with 225 pounds, I don't have to throw them back, I can bring them in. But if you're going out targeting every day, that changes statistically what the outcome of the program will be. So I think a workshop to bring all of these points in to define these as before it's expanded. Or even run next yeah. year, in my eyes, I mean, that's just, is there's too many variables right now. I mean, I'm I'm taking a burden on that. I mean, that's just how I look at it. Is pilot program sounds great, but there's too many things I have to iron out. The guy right now, I know there's guys that are fishing 40 fluke nets, trying to catch that fluke. I mean, come on. The, I mean, I can't even set, I can't set one net, and the person bombing me left and right, and I'm like. You know, there's people bought, I mean, that person's, you can see the effort. I mean, I'm not there throwing any people's names out, but you can see the effort. You see the person landing no food care. They used to not even go fishing during the summer. Then all of a sudden they get it, and now they're looking all year round. And so that's gonna, yeah, it's good for them. I mean, they made an extra 70000 for the year doing it. I would like, you know, it's not even, not even that I'd like to do it. I think it should be fair for everybody. You know, these people, some of the participants took part in the other pilot program that we have in the state also. You know, it just seems like, yet again, research, it kind of seems like if you got your niche cut in, you kind of slip into everything, and then all of a sudden, oh, too bad for you. You know, or you have a violation. Well, how do we have a violation? You don't know what a violation, you know? You get very, you get very testy. I think a lot more people should be here. I think, honestly, in my eyes, we should, all the participants should sit in front and produce what they've had and show how they have fished their fishery. And you'll see how the fishery, and you'll, they should overdo it. This year, before it goes any further, I think they should suspend this or open it up to everybody. Thanks. Terry, then Bob. Uh, what what's happened here is you've created uh, three types of Rhode Island license holders. You have a Rhode Island license holder only. You have a Rhode Island license holder with a federal permit, and then you have a Rhode Island license holder with a federal permit and a fluke exemption. So, um, bringing up what was passed in the fall of 2004, and I strongly advised against it was when we adopted the most restrictive law. And I warned capital what you asked for. But once you pass that most restrictive rule, 
uh, that made everyone landing more than 50 pounds of flounder that hold a Rhode Island license in violation, or anyone landing more than 1,000 pounds of codfish or in any one day in violation. Well, what happened was um, those people are federal permit holders. So they weren't, that law wasn't enforced on them. Um, so when a law is made and it's most restrictive, it speaks for itself. It's more, most restrictive. It doesn't matter. As long as you have a Rhode Island license, it, you're bound by what that license is and what that law says. And what we did in Rhode Island was we passed a law in the fall of 2004 saying we're going to adopt the most restrictive rule which is Rhode Island. Rhode Island says if you want to land um, summer flounder or you want to land uh, black back flounder, well, it's 50 pounds a day. It doesn't matter. And the way around that is to surrender your Rhode Island license, buy a Rhode Island landing permit, fish on your federal permit, and then whatever the federal law says, if it's uh, 10,000 pounds a day, as long as you have your Rhode Island landing permit, you're illegal. But a, a Rhode Island license holder who um, has brown fish days, they're coming in with 2,000 pounds of flounder, or they buy flounder, and they're out there landing 1,500 pounds a day until they catch up what they have for. Um, you, you've created, you see what I'm saying? You've created three different classes, but we all hold the same Rhode Island license. We all have Rhode Island lobster. I mean, uh, driver's license. We all shop at Stop and Shop, and we all go to you know the same stores. Our children go to the same schools, but they're they're different. They're different. You have those three different in in the licenses, and and that right there in itself isn't fair. Um, so to have what, what's going on now for these people here, they, and to put in more effort is going against what this gentleman down here was saying. It, it wasn't what the intention was, and maybe you should go back and look at it, that now you've got people uh, gearing up, and they're, they're rubbing their hands together because they know now from now until uh, the end of April, they're going to make sure that they have that fish um, every week. And these are people that normally wouldn't have had them anyway, but now now they're doing it. Um, do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Does it, does it make any sense that you're classified, you've broken the Rhode Island license up into three groups? It's almost like Dr. Seuss's book, The Star Billy Speeches. And he wrote that in 1963. And that's what you have. You have the Star Bellies and you have the regular speeches. And everyone sitting in this room are all the regular speeches. All the star billies, they're not here because they have everything they want. Thank you. Bob? Well, cost is a special class if you design. And what really gets to me is you want the data, but yet you won't go out there and get the data. This gentleman said 40 nets. How do you know it ain't 140 nets that fish? How do you know they're not throwing over all kinds of discs guys and just keeping the big ones in high grade? How do you know any of this? You can't possibly know. You have never, ever, ever, never, ever taken an observer on any of those trips with any of those boats. And that's what you should be doing if you're going to really try to get your data. And then you'll find out, like this gentleman just said, oh, they, they were, they're intensifying their effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and commenting on behalf of the so association, we support a continuation and expansion of the program as proposed. Uh, we, I would suggest, or maybe I should ask a question, is it the intent of number three the, if the, you're going to solicit applications from January 1st until March 30th, or just during a window during that period? So the intent here was just to set an a clear application period. Um, it is yet to be determined. Not knowing whether we're going to go forward, it's hard to determine, or who the participants are going to be. It's hard to determine how the application period is going to go. Our intention was to that apply more or less to new applicants, but it's still everything's right. up in the air. Right. 
And so my suggestion is to shorten up the application period to four weeks, uh, but notice it on a listserv so everybody in the state gets a notice. And, uh, okay. and like I said, I'm on a, however this goes, Bob, we got to do it, it should be from November before the first of the year because we do group by the weekly. So I want to get it, so I want to be in it. If it you should have the first, you should know by January 1st if you're in it for the year, right? Yeah. So you should be, so. License for renewal, well, you should get it. That's what's efficient, that's when the, the whole state quota <coughs> starts up again. So that way, I mean, if anyone can get in, and I can know to go buy some food permit right now, you know? So then I can go buy like 80 foot in the morning when I just have a food convention right out the gate. If I get picked. And then you'll see a lot of effort really go right down, you know? I'm, I'm just saying that there should be a small window before January 1st. Thank you, John. Bob, then David? Yeah. Is this program been put together for the purpose of the BMS? Truly, because they have to have that, correct? In order to be part of Clarify, yeah, you have to have a BMS on your boat. Now, when you have fixed gear guys, they would probably love that BMS to be on everyone's boat because then they would know who went through the gear. But I don't understand why the program has to have a BMS. Uh, what, what's the purpose of a BMS? But it's not, it's not really a BMS, right? Because the guy that, he said it was some program. When the definition, when people think, oh, BMS, they think, oh, this. $2,000, $5,000 machine on my boat that sends out a signal. And he said, no, no, it wasn't that. It's just some, I have, you have a cell phone and you get like this app downloaded in it. Like cheap, I mean, it's cheap money, 200 bucks maybe or so. I don't know what you, what's it tell the position of the boat? I, I don't even know. Maybe you could comment on that. I, I can clarify that uh, you can have the federally approved VMS, the expensive one, as you said, or the other device that we have been using is a secure device that functions exactly like a satellite-based BMS, except it's based on cellular technology. Like I said, it's a secure device. It costs $300 to buy and then a $300 per year subscription. Who let the truck is on the road? You know where the truck is at at all times. You know where that boat is at. If he's going into somebody's locks again, yeah, you will know. You know, so get everybody on the BMS so we can catch those guys going through. We can kill them at the fixed gear of any kind. I mean, you know, come on. The BMS comes in the handy to know exactly if they went into a closed area. Thank you. David Denter. No, I, I was just going to comment on one of the comments that was made before that if there's a way to back up the application period so it's open, for instance, uh, the entire month of December so that the fishermen know who's in and can start fishing January 1st. As part of the program, that would be desirable. Thank you. Terry? Uh, I have a BMS. I, mm -hmm. I had to purchase it back when I had federal permit. And I keep it for to prove my legality of my fishing activity. Uh, but I had a dragon dragging me up, and then I had to call the dragon up my gear. And I called and I said, use theirs and use mine. They said that they couldn't use that for law enforcement. So, you, know that? It, you think so? Yeah, you think so. Well, they were there, yeah, and I said, check that. his and check mine, and they mm -hmm. said, well, we can't do that. Well, Listen, guys go in the closed areas, and they get called up. Hey, come in, you got to find me before I see a load. Any other comments on the research aggregate program? So just, just a question, like, so while I'm leaving this meeting, scratch my head, are we going to, so just like check, check list service, is it going to be, I mean, he had the guy down there, a good idea, we'll have a meeting on it, like, so I'm going to leave here tonight and not really wonder what's going on. Are they going to extend it? Like, so the director's going to make a ruling on this, and then is there going to be a meeting on it? Is it just going to be a new application period? Or any, any input on what's going to happen? Sure, I can clarify that. So uh, right now, the proposal as in regulation runs till the end of this year. In order to make it go two more years, we'd have to get it approved through the usual channel. So this is the first step where we had the workshop. This is the, the first step we hear the public comment. It will be going next to the Rhode Island Marine Fishery Council. They'll make a recommendation to the director and she'll decide whether or not it goes for you're two running, more years or not. Right now, we don't know if it's gonna go for two more years. It's, well, you're, it's you're running out of time. If you're trying to get it for January 1st, 
he said December 2nd is the Variety of Marine Fishery Council meeting, and then it usually takes a good month or two months for the director to make a decision on it. Now into January into February, where's there a meeting that it gets put in between this and I mean, pretty much in my eyes right now, I can't even see the program going further than this yet. So if no decision's made, they, like they, Patrick just said, January 1st, the program would stop until it was re-implemented again, or? To clarify, that's correct. Okay. That, that's, what I was just, that's what I'm just saying, if you want that window, mm -hmm. And then what you're getting is a partial year worth of evidence. Because let's say it comes out in March, February, March, and you guys need some time to pick your participants. We will move on for this, now we're into March. Then we'll find out in April if they're fishing, if they're in this thing, and you know, all now that guy, if we're really doing on how based on how the business goes, he could have already been fishing. So I mean, I think maybe do our one year worth of research program this year, take this coming year to regroup and put on a docket for the following year after that. Well, maybe by then everyone will be in favor for weekly aggregates. I mean, I just don't see it going. We're running out of time. Mm -hmm. This should have been on like uh, August public hearing. We're always down the last wire. We always do this, and there's too many variables that even we can't. We don't have time to review this because the person's still fishing. So how can we even review what how this last year's program went when there's still? I mean, I doubt John. I don't know if John's still food fishing. I mean, I don't think he. I don't. I don't know. Maybe he is, but I mean, I know other people that are 100% food fishing. They're crying about the price right now because price of food is a dollar fifty. So, but I just want to say that like, make that for a reference. Either you got to make a speedy action, or you're gonna run out of time because December second is a council meeting. I don't know what Dave will. I don't know what Dave will say. Maybe he has a little more input. He knows how to. He's been in this shoe before, you know. Any other comments? Um, That's a comment. I don't know if Dave has something to comment on how the process. All right. Seeing other comments? No other comments? I'm going to move on to uh, number 11. And that is uh, the proposed new adoption of uh, Part 13, the Cooperative Multi State Possession and Landing Pilot Program for Summer Flounder. Another so just uh, highly encourage folks to read the, uh, read the section in its entirety. I have a summary of the proposed rule. And that is to uh, authorize commercial fishers to simultaneously carry possession limits for and land summer flounder in cooperating states during the same fishing trip. This is for winter one subperiod only, that's January through April. Applicants must be licensed or otherwise authorized to possess uh, and, and or land summer flounder in at least one of the cooperating states. Applicant vessels must be permitted by NOAA fisheries to possess and or land summer flounder harvested from federal waters and applicants must not have been assessed a criminal or administrative penalty, state or federal, to commercial fishing regulations or laws within the past three years. Summer flounder catch intended for landed in, landing in Rhode Island and any cooperating state must be stored separately with the port identified. And once again, please see the, the language in the notice rule. Any comments on the uh, multi-state landing? Terry, then John. What you're doing there is you're just in, encouraging more effort. Again, the same as what or uh, with that pilot program or uh, with it, with certain people putting more effort forward. This what this is doing is and it's just uh, it's putting more effort and it's just going to eat up more of the fish uh, that are allotted to us. Uh, I can just see that right now. I I was on a drag last winter. I I jumped aboard and. I can just see that happening. It's just going to be more effort. They're going to make sure that um, when you only allow so much of each thing, it's like grocery shopping. You go on the aisle and you fill every one of those things on the list to the maximum of what you're allowed to have, and then you call it a trip. And that's what that's doing. That's encouraging them to make sure that they have um, 
all that they can have for whatever state. And if it's going to be Rhode Island Mass, or even if it's Rhode Island Mass in Connecticut, I mean, you're talking a lot more effort on a fish than if they were to make three trips, because the weather window might not allow them to do that. And so those are fish that are being saved, and that could spawn. But now there's <coughs> going to be more effort, and they're going to make sure that they have it, because that's what I've seen. It looks like grocery shopping. You just put on the list and you make sure you have everything, even right down to the 500 skate wings that you're allowed um, on a big drive. So as far as what, what that's going there, it, it can't for a federal permit holder. Rhode Island license holder with a federal permit, that's what it's doing. You're just catering to that elite group again. Thank you. Thank you. John? Yeah, I had a question. Um, this this program, because um, Bob made a good point earlier about um, you know, Massachusetts having a pretty big Manhattan quota because there's a good chance that a lot of the Manhattan that they were actually landing were harvested in Rhode Island waters, but they, you know, our fate comes down, catches, scoops them all up the bay, drives them up the Fall River, dumps them, and they probably landed them on, on a Massachusetts license up there because it's Nothing like this existed back then, so they couldn't land it on a Rhode Island license in Massachusetts. So they're scooping it up out of Narragansett Bay, lower Narragansett Bay management area, Rhode Island waters, and taking our fish into Massachusetts, and therefore bulking up their historical quota while eroding ours. And so my question would be, would a program like this, I guess, so these guys were to land these fish, would that fish be, one, would that fish be coming off of like say a gentleman went and fished in Massachusetts waters and then landed some fish in Rhode Island or fished in um, Rhode Island waters and landed in Massachusetts, would those fish be landed on that state's license? And if so, um, how are they gonna verify that? Like would there be a VMS involved in this okay, or not? Or is it just kind of, um, is that up for debate or up for discussion right now? But mostly what I'm concerned about is Rhode Island losing quota or losing their fish to get landed on another state. Like, is going to come off of Rhode Island quota? So just to clarify, uh, if you are in this program, you are, you can, right now it's for winter one only, so it's presumed those fish are going to be outside of state waters. Uh, when you're coming in, you have to hit each state and land that amount in that state, and it will only come off the quota of that state. So okay. you can't land it all in one state that comes off that state. To clarify. Pat? Uh, just so, first of all, I think this is gonna, this is definitely going to increase a lot more effort in the group landings. Because now they're doing these multi-state landings. A lot of states are binding up. So like just say a guy from New Jersey. You know, he, he comes up and he, he has a Connecticut and a Rhode Island and a Massachusetts. He's like, ah, I can get my New Jersey with it. Now we're all connected, right? So now all of a sudden you have all these other people that have Rhode Island fluke exemptions, and there's a lot of them out there. There's 173 that are just miscellaneous, just erratic. But now that guy, can have, if he can do a multi-state, and he can go out and catch them all in one day, if he can go out and catch them all in one trip, he's gonna come in and get, he's gonna have a lot more votes, I think, in my eyes. It's opened up the door for a lot more people to land the fluke be participant in Rhode Island Plymouth because now they can come up there and say, I can land 500, <coughs> I can land my 2,000 in Rhode Island, I can land my 500 in Connecticut, my 1,000 in Mass, where before they probably wouldn't do that. You know, they used to just pick the, oh, what's the best state? Or oh, down, down here is worth a lot more, All right, so they wouldn't even get those, the you know, they wouldn't even come up there. And the other thing is, is how does enforcement think they're gonna do this. I mean, that's all I ever hear about whenever we propose a weekly limit or anything. Oh, enforce it. How are they going to enforce this? So they're going to come in with three or four states worth of limits of fish. The DM guy comes down now. He comes down. They're going to have to call the number up. Who's going to watch these fish? Who's going to be checking them? You know, is enforcement going to come down and check every time? 
how this cares and how this is going to work. I mean, I think it's a, uh, I think they're trying to jump on the bandwagon with Connecticut and uh, New York. And it's just, I think we're going to get a lot more landings in the state because it's coming off the ground at 51% is going to start shrinking a lot more. Bob? I believe it's uh, Virginia, um, North Carolina, and I think New Jersey that I have a program like that. They can go and land in New Jersey, but it does not go into their quota. If it was uh, a North Carolina, say, say New Jersey was closed, North Carolina boat comes in and says they want to land this and take it to North Carolina. That's, they can do that. They have that program. Now, after a few years, those three states, correct? Are you familiar with that? I have heard of it, yes. Well, they have been doing it for quite a few years. So it's not something new. And it doesn't go on that state's quota. It goes on the state that, they come, that it's going to. Between those three states, it works it out. Thanks. I'm going to go to uh, Terry this way. The reason that that came up, Bob, was because once Oregon Inlet became impassable, then Warren Cheese Harbor was drying up, and they still had fish buyers in there. So then they made a deal with Virginia where they could go in and go to the south side of the Chesapeake Bay as a, a place in there to take out. And then those fish would be trucked down to these certain fish houses that would just shrivel up and disappear. So that's how that all came about. I didn't realize that they could also bring the fish into New Jersey and then truck them down into those two states. But that's how that all came about. Because of Oregon and went once they put the bridges in and that changed that shoulder all off. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Now one more question with this uh this is just a clarification question though. So to land the multi state you only have to have a reliable land permit, correct? Uh, no, to clarify, if you are coming in for, on winter one from, from Federal Waters to land, you'd have to have your your ability to land in each of the states you want to land. I understand that, but all that would require you to do is have a Rhode Island landing permit. You don't have to have a Rhode Island state fishing license to have a Rhode Island landing permit. That's correct. So that is, what, that is what my point is, is there's a lot of traffic that comes to Massachusetts that guys have Rhode Island food delivery. So they'll be stopping in Rhode Island, dump their food off, and then continue to Massachusetts, where they traditionally couldn't do that before. So I think this I think there, will, there could potentially be a lot more effort. A lot a lot more effort just by doing this, you know. And I'd like the division to really keep an eye on if they start seeing those 2,000 pounds of fish start coming in quicker and quicker, you know, put the brakes on, do not go that 54% because you can't afford to lose any of it. And is this uh, peer to peer with the sea bass? It's like the... This is summer flounder. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, let's see, okay, so uh, one, two, three, four, fifth, uh, fifth, yeah, they're not really numbers. So applicants must have, uh, have not been assessed a criminal or administrative penalty, state or federal, to commercial fishing regulations or laws uh, in the past three years. Statements like this just make the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I mean, unfortunately, we're all in an industry. You can be in violation of anything every given day. I mean, look, we fish 200 days a year. I mean, in three days, that's 600 days. I mean, I'll give you, like, and maybe at a future point, like enforcement should sit down with fishermen and say, like, what is like an intentional bad violation versus a a you know uh, a slap on the wrist violation? Well, I'll give you an example. So I'm a gillnet. I'm required to use gillnet pingers. I have to go out and buy these pingers. They're hundred dollars uh, each. You have to change the batteries once a year, and you know, one spring the EDM enforcement guys went out and checked and got a couple of my pingers that weren't fishing. Uh, they weren't. Uh, putting out a signal or wherever they were. I, mean, I changed the batteries, like the direction said. I spent my own money on these things from an approved vendor. And now, so I, I get to go up in front of the little enforcement meeting to say, oh, well, you know, 
these things won't work. And I was like, well, geez, I mean, most of them work. I mean, I, I bought these things. I'm not, I didn't give them approval. So anyway, yeah, okay, so I have, I, and I believe on my state thing, the only violation I have is a non-functioning pinger. I mean, I didn't go out and spend $100 on these things and spend batteries so I can be in violation from an approved vendor. I mean, I, I hear little like stories, the guy with the lobster trap, when the, the event was one in 15 16 and it says it right on it, it's one in 15 16 and the enforcement guy comes down and says, no, this isn't one in 15 16 This is, you know, one in three quarter year in violation, even though the thing says it on it. Or, uh, I mean, it's just, maybe in a future time, we can sit down or the guy that, you know, plays a fish and brings it home for dinner. I mean, we're, we're killing thousands. Some boats are killing thousands. And this cop every day is going over and that's okay. And this poor guy can't cut up a fish and bring it home for dinner. And, and if he gets checked, now he's going to be, you know, blackball from this program or that program or the next program. So when I see like statements like this, it just, I, I don't know, it just, uh, like I said, unfortunately we're in this industry that everyone, every day you leave the dock to go fishing, or not even leave the dock to go fishing. I mean, another minor violation I had is when I bought a VMS uh, through the feds, an expensive machine, and it was putting out signals, and the next thing I know I'm getting some fine because it, it would flash, it was a sky bay, it would flash, sometimes it would flash green and it would flash red, and, I was supposed to be putting out two signals an hour, and you know, years later they went through it and figured out that this thing wasn't sending out signals when it should have. And uh, I, I mean, it's just ridiculous. You know, charged with fishing. Uh, my boat didn't leave the dock, but they charged with fishing for some technical definition of fishing. I mean, it, it's just so convoluted that when I see blanket statements like this, oh, we're going to be able to keep somebody out of the program. You know, in the last three years you went fishing, you got a little, you know, I mean, I don't know, for something. There's got to be like, you know, like understanding to say, oh yeah, everyone could get a violation for something. But is this really, you know, you know, if you look at maybe give a little discretion, look at this, you know, look at this guy. Oh, he brought home a fillet. Okay, he got caught. Well, I mean, come on, that's not the end of the world here. You know, you shouldn't stop people from, you know, the doing something like this. So that's like I say, neither here nor there. But maybe in the future we can sit down and hash out a little bit more. You can do it for the but the. Uh, sexual, uh, sexual charges, class one, class yeah, two, class I mean, three. Terry. I, I, that's a good point. I didn't even bother setting the limit this year because for me to put 80 nets in the water, which is a state limit, would have entitled me to have 88 pings. So if I had one malfunctioning pinger, which is something out of my control, that would have been a violation. It was the year prior to that, the DM was out there checking for 22 pound anchors. They were also checking for things. Well, when you get south of the island, the tide runs really hard. And what happened was once the rubber boat lifted it up to check what I had, they had drifted to the west. So once they threw it back over and went to check the next string that I had, which was west of that, I was in violation because now that string was too close to the 2,000 yard from where the other string was. Well, when I tried to explain to them what had happened and that they created it, well, then it became an argument and it was an argument that I wasn't gonna win. So, like he's saying, I mean, there's, there's gotta be, there's gotta be a meeting brought up and we've gotta start talking about what are violations and what are nitpicking violations? Because um, I went and hauled the string and moved it. I, I had already hauled it. I went and rehauled it, moved it well away from it, and I just bit my tongue, which was a good thing to do because, you know, but he, Greg's absolutely right as far as what that is right there. And another thing is I've learned that whatever you have a violation, it stays on the record for 15 years. 15. That's, that's, that's pretty amazing. 15 years. 15 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I don't think there's a person that I know, especially myself, that has not been late filling out a special trip report. Well, let me tell you something. That's a violation. You got, if you missed that date and you didn't do it on the proper time period, that's a violation. Sometimes we're really going through some severe penalties. And uh, I would say, if not 80, 90% of the people, have, one time or another, have, have not been 
I'm fine with that. And they can, they can get busted. Thank you. Hey. Well, that, that, that is a severity, you know. And it, and it says fishing, commercial fishing regulations and laws. But well, like you said, like, it's the same thing that comes back to the same thing as uh, give the discretion. Who's, who's the bad guy and who's the good guy, you know? <coughs> this guy's fine, you know, he has dinner. Oh, this guy, we're gonna arrest him. You know, everyone has boats. You know, if you change the hydraulic lines, your boat, maybe you got a little rain, a little bit of a uh, little water rainbow, everyone has a little rainbow on that boat. Oh, now I can't, I can't participate in this. You know, this. And you know another very big point, I'm sorry. I, don't yeah. think it's I will, I will say one thing, we're kind of getting off the topic of the no, cooperative multi-state here. I hear you loud and clear about the classifying of bad violations. We can try to come back around. I'm going to go with Ali as I spoke yet. Uh, maybe you could change that paragraph to say something at, at the discretion of the director. Maybe she can review the uh, violations and she can make a determination instead of having it in bold print, you're eliminated. Something like to that effect. So there is a discretion policy involved. So if it's you know some people think it's a minor infraction, leave it up to the uh, up to the director to decide. Thank you, Bob. Another very big big point here. In fact, I know so many guys that would not guilty of a penalty, but they say, hey, I can't afford a lawyer. I can't afford going and taking this to the Supreme Court over their unconstitutional unfairness of these special classes that they're doing, so something like that. But you know, the guy got a violation for it. Well, he's gonna pay maybe the thousand, twelve hundred, whatever, and he's gonna have that violation. But all the time, he wasn't guilty of it. it just, I see it happening every day. People just turning around and saying, yeah, it's paid fine. I'm not gonna argue with it. Well, what we did, it's out of business. Thank you. Great. Quick technical thing, anybody that fishes gill nets is a definition on what your gill net and buoys have to look like. So you set extreme gill nets, you go home, a tugboat comes by and knocks your end off, guess what, you're in violation. I mean, that, this is how ridiculous some of the stuff is. Anything else on the cooperative multi-state possession and landing pilot? All right, so this is the last item. Item 12 is uh, the proposed adoption of a wealth pot tagging program. Uh, once again, highly uh, recommend that you read the proposed language. Here's a summary of the proposed rule. First is uh, it'd be an adoption of a tagging program similar to lobster trap tag program. Uh, one time use fastenable tags issued annually. Each fisherman would be allotted, allowed to get up to 300 original tags. Uh, you could get 30 additional, 10% uh, additional for routine loss, that would be 30 additional tags. Uh, there will be catastrophic loss and gear rotation tags available. Tags purchased by fishermen via the DMF, so you buy them buy them through us instead of going directly to the vendor, it's a little change from the way we do the lobster. Those tags right now cost 14 cents per tag. Tags are valid from, right now the notice uh, rule says tags would be valid from September 1st to October, sorry, August 31st annually. Rule would take effect next year in 2020. And once again, please look at the rule for uh, for the exact language. Any comments on the wealth tag, Al? Yeah, um, I read over the document. I have a couple of questions. One is uh, in the document under 4.18 commercial wealth pot tagging under I1, it says original tags. And it says eligible license holders may order to the maximum pot limit. Would you define eligible license holder? Sure. To clarify, that would be a multi-purpose license holder or a principal effort license holder with a wealth endorsement or a commercial fishing license holder with a wealth endorsement. Okay, a comment I have, uh, and I brought this up at a meeting last year, as a state license holder, multi-purpose holder, uh, we were allowed to purchase up to 300 tags. But how does that come to effect with a federal license permit holder, uh, Area 2 federal permit? As I understand it now, they're required to put federal lobster trap tags 
in their wealth parts or comp parts. So if that individual also is in possession of a multi-purpose Rhode Island State license, how does that play out? And I don't quite get the, uh, the correlation between the two. If he, if he's, he presents his multi-purpose license and nobody asks him if he has a federal permit or not, he, he can purchase up to 300 tags, put them in the straps legally. But if he has a federal permit, he has to put his federal lobster trap tags in there. So there's a discrepancy there, and I know you're not going to change the federal rules, but how does that play out with the state? And to further that, if you look in the definition of traps, they, I mean, I went through all the definitions between a lobster trap, a lobster pot, conch pot, crab pot, and uh, I don't understand in the first place how the feds ever required to have a, a trap tag and a conch pot because if you, if you really look at the definitions and read it word for word, which I did, and I'll just make out one point, uh, under part of trap definition, it says at the very last sentence, it says, uh, the opening where escape is difficult. So when you look at a, a conch trap, it's like having a lobster trap with the door wide open on it, right? So it's not designed or intended to catch and retain lobsters. I know that's a different issue, that's a federal issue, but I just wonder how this is gonna play out with some of our fishermen, you know, here in the state. Are they gonna be able to apply for, if they have a multi-purpose license, apply for contract tags and use them legally? Or are they gonna to have to have to stick with the, using a lobster trap tag? So say it's a, probably a bit bigger of a clarification that we could go into, be happy to talk about it in more detail in the office, but I can say that on just on the surface, if you're going to, so if you have, you have the requirement, you're a federal officer, you have an LTA, and you're also going to be fishing your wealth pots, then yeah, you have to have the tag, both tags and both in state water. Uh, if you have no intention of keeping lobsters from your wealth pots and you're not gonna fish them on the same trip as a lobster, as a lobster trip while you're holding your gear, uh, that would be a case, well, Oh, you're the, the, you're right, the vessel would well, come well, into play, well, so you, you are... Uh, well, the federal permit follows the vessel. Yes. Yeah, anything capable of catching a lobster trap, I, I found this out because I, I spent $25,000 on a rope trap. I was going to go chase wilts. And I had a lobster permit, and federal agent came down and said, before you can set, anything capable of catching a lobster. You can put a five gallon bucket on and it has to have a trap tag. So a lobster boat that's hauling anything. If you so have a federal lobster permit, if it's hauling anything, if you're hauling soda bottles, it has to have a trap tag. So all these guys that have been doing it, I got in a very heated argument with all the con fishermen who fish their 800 lobster trap and then will go con for a 300 ball trap. That's against the law. And since we have adopted that with the sea bass and everything else, and Scott Oshevsky and uh, Scott knows that, that once we have uh, adopted all these tagging regulations, a guy who has a multi-purpose license is going to have to put a trap tag and everything. So if you have zero trap tag, can't go conk. Then we are followed by the feds. Thank you. Let go, John. Then, so um, I was kind of thinking about what Al just said, with um, and, and also what Pat just said. It would be, it's kind of contradictory if a guy has a federal permit, because technically they're also supposed to put the the lobster tag in it. Now, however, Rhode Island enforces that because they try to be consistent with federal regulations. Now, if they were to make a concession for that, that would be one thing. However, I think it's kind of pointless to say, hey, you know, the, the number 300 has been on the books forever, just like it's been 50 scut pots and 50 sea bass pots forever, but there's no tags, and there's crab pots, but there's no tags. And I think it's unfair to one group of fishermen to say, you know what, we're going to step into your fishery, give you a bunch of tags, but everything else, we're still not going to put tags in it. And you know, the truth of the matter is, you know, a guy who's um, who goes conking but also goes lobstering, you know, conch seasons 
up and moving, there's a lot of conks around, you can just say, yeah, screw it, I'll take my lobster gear out of the water, get gear rotation tags, put 800 lobster tags on every single one of these conk pots, now it's a lobster pot, catch a conk bycatch, and there you go. And so, I mean, it, you, you, it's redundant. It's kind of pointless, unless you guys even step in and say, okay, there's, there's, here's, your, here's your 50 fish pot tags, here's your 50 conk tags, here's your 100 crab tags, here's your lobster tags, and, and, and then somehow delineate the difference between every single type of gear find some way to define every single trap and what it is, and it's gotta have this particular tag in it, but then you're at the point where you're saying, if you're a Rhode Island fisherman, you wanna put anything in the water, it's gotta have a tag in it, and if it doesn't have a tag, I mean everything right down to a middle pot or an eel pot. So, I think before you even discuss something like this, that whole issue needs to be hashed out. I mean, if they adopt the federal law, they wanna be that many, they wanna that be that many crab, uh, calm traps in the water, there wouldn't be that many mineral pots or anything because there's not a lot of state allocated traps. There's state only water traps. So that's a very slippery slope. And I don't know how that, I mean, that's that's kind of avoiding the guy who has the area, who has the area two lobster farm, but also, and I think we adopted that with the lobster traps, you can't haul crab traps on the same trip as a conk pot, so I mean, this just seems like this could turn into a nightmare, you know, unless we figure it out. If you do, like, if you adopt the federal law, that means that's it. How many other lots of trap tags you have? That'd be it. If you have zero, then you can't set anything in the water. Thanks. I'm gonna go, <coughs> sorry. I'll go Greg then. Yeah, I'm all done. I think this falls under federally, it's called the most restrictive rule. And that's how uh, they can muscle their way and basically and control your efforts because they say that uh, you know you don't have the option of following what you want. You have to follow what is said of the most restrictive of the fe federal and state is if you're multi-jurisdictional. So I mean I could be wrong, but I think they you know I mean as it sits right now, unless you get some exemptions in there, I don't think there's any leeway to argue with them on it. But um, that's how uh, I believe that they. Uh, <laughs> They shoot one that's in there to, to get you to put a, a, a lobster pot tag and a wealth pot because, you know, most restrictive rule. So, I mean, you, you basically have to revisit that, I guess. Thanks. Adam? Yeah, it, it really, the crux of it comes under the definition of what is a lobster pot and what is a conch pot. And the state has already defined it. In the document, if you look further, there's part one on the definition of general provisions. It says conch pots, and by the way, for a clerical notification, uh, there's a few places that they still use the word conch, and it's in the uh, definitions there, and also in, this, in the document, there's a few places where you're still using the word conch instead of whelk. I, I can tell you where they are if you want to know, but anyhow, conch pots, it says, uh, means any pot designed or adapted principally, there's the P words, adapted principally for the catching and taking of conchs, all right? That describe, that's the state's definition of a conch pot. It's not designed to catch a lobster or a crab mm. or a fish. And on the lobster pot, the state's definition reads, any pot designed or adapted principally for the catching or taking of lobsters or Jonah crabs. That's the state's definition. It's not designed to catch conchs. So from where, the way I read it, a conch pot is not designed to catch lobsters according to the state's definition. So I don't understand where the, where the feds that even came into the, if they look at the state's definition, I don't know what their definition is, but if you look at the state's definition, it, sh it shouldn't be required to carry a, a, a lobster trap tag in it. So I don't know how you would proceed. I think the state would have to, you know, go to the feds and show their definitions and, and try and get something changed for the state of Rhode Island. I just don't think, it doesn't affect me personally because I don't have the federal permit, but it does affect some of our fishermen, local fishermen. And you know, when you listen to the governor and everything and want to create jobs and support the fishing industry, I mean, the House of Representatives passed a resolution to support the fishermen in the state of Rhode Island. This goes against all of that. I mean, we have young fishermen trying to get into this business and make a living at it. And they can't put their federal lobster trap tags in their, in their conch pots. So it's a huge issue as far as I'm concerned. And it's, and it's, and it's got to be addressed. And I don't know how you go about doing it, but 
I hate to see some of these guys left out of the conf business when they can make a few bucks seasonally and they're not allowed to do it unless they put those little officer trap tags in it. And some of them don't have them. They don't want to have enough of them. So I don't know if the state would have to go to the feds and give them their definition and say, according to the state, they're not putting it in the lobster pot. It's not designed to catch and retain lobsters. Maybe it's something to work for <coughs> in the future, but I just thought I'd bring it up. I just think, I think it's un an unfair disadvantage to some of these uh, state permit holders. Thank you. Uh, Want to go, Bob? Geez, it's both at the point. Is it possible that uh, you have the ASMFC, which is three miles of state water in, and then you have the NOAA, Federal National Fishery Service, three miles all the way out? That if the cough bodies in the state was, that they do not have the jurisdiction, the state has jurisdiction. Well, the problem is the permit follows the boat. They do not bust the guys because they do not have jurisdictional status. They do. Because Maryland went through the same the same situation here. I know one of my buddies at comps down in Maryland, and he put, he surrendered his area two lobster permit with 800 trap tags. He surrendered his area three permit trap. His area three per, permit at the time of the 450 lobster trap because he couldn't fish in Maryland state water comp because of the five most restrictive rule. So now he really hit himself, you know, because he. You have a thousand, a thousand area three traps and two hundred area twos. You know, just to go comp it down there. I mean, they do huge down there. They fish five thousand traps, so they can't. He had to give up all the time. All the rights of the law. So I don't know how that's going to go through. Maryland tried to drop it off and didn't work out too hard. Thanks. Uh, I'm gonna go deep first, then Terry. Uh, I'd just like to second what Al said that the state could somehow look into uh, you know, how our definition of the traps possibly doesn't line up with the federal definition. Sure, thanks. It, it doesn't matter because with, with the most restrictive rule in the feds with them, where they were, uh, uh, adopted it, they control all the way to the shoreline. Because uh, even when I was a state boat only, I, I was charged with a federal violation because even though I was state only, they told me they controlled all the way to the shoreline and under the most restrictive rule, I was in violation. And that's what I was talking about earlier. Once we adopted that most, we thought we wanted the mayor of the feds and we adopted it. So now we have to abide by it because it's clearly what it says, most restrictive. Whatever it is, the more restrictive of the law is what we have to Follow <coughs> and it's just cut, cut and dry. Go argue with the feds. They'll just tell you they control all the way to the shoreline. It doesn't matter if you state or not. The, 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 the state their, their resources are endless. They'll just tie you up and throw you down. down. You know, we're getting, we're getting kind of far afield, guys. Let's try okay. to keep it to just the left yeah, tagging program. But it, under the most restrictive rule, it's not going to work because the feds will step in. They they supersede you. They're more restrictive. Yeah, well, I uh, John first. I, I want to kind of reiterate a little bit of what I said earlier, but um, I want to make a suggestion or a motion to suspend any discussion about this and have a workshop regarding tagging of conch pots, fish pots, crab pots, miscellaneous pots, whatever, and, and talk about that as a whole program, rather than saying we're going to tag one, one more particular type of gear, leave everything else up for question, and then, then the definitions and everything are all up for debate, and you're really not solving anything. So unless they're going to go step in and do like Mass does, and you, know, you get 50 fish tags, 300 cock tags, this many lobster tags, and that's it. So you get there's no point in doing this. You just just scrap that. Don't even don't don't even bring it to the council. There should be there, there should be a meeting about this whole tagging thing. Uh, well, the whole state and federal water thing in general, pregnant boats and that are not considered. You have a boat that has a federal permit. It's state license with pregnant boat syndrome. So you won't be able to fish in state waters or not. That because they, they won't go through any of this because that'd be like say, I have a federal monkfish permit, I'm under a federal monk day in federal waters fishing for monkfish, then tomorrow I come in and fish state waters and buy by state uh, limits. Now that's it's Rob Magnus and Stevenson. The whole thing is 
I, believe me, I love for it to happen because that way I can go state fishing for a day, federal fishing for a day, have my area two lobster trap tag, my state water trap tag, and fish along the same boat, but it's not going to happen. It'd be nice if it did. I'll <coughs> laugh you all the way to the door if you made it happen. I think it should, Bob. Thanks. I'm going to go right here, Al, then Bob. Oh, I'd just like to say for the record that overall I'm against the 300 trap tags if, uh, like Al said, in the state definitions of the traps, it's contradictory with the federal law. Thanks. Yeah, I think I might make a recommendation in the document. I think it, instead of putting down an eligible license holder, I think it should be explained explicitly what that is so people understand who's eligible to get the tags if that program ever goes into effect. Because in the whole document, it doesn't say who is eligible for it or not. Thanks. Ah. I think it's a good case in point that's been made here that, okay, here's the law. And you say, okay, I'm right. Let's take it to court. It's going to cost you a fortune. You win. Who gets penalized? Right now, what we should be doing is going to the state and saying, hey, you know, the DEM makes up or tells us that we can't fish in a certain area. And then we find out that that area was open and we all lost income. We should be able to get compensated and sue the DEM for that. That should be a law that's on the books that they pay the lawyer. Right now, you know, they walk away with it and they don't have nothing to hey, well, Maybe they're going to pay everybody. Right that's about it. You can't go after them. There should be a law in effect so that they really can <coughs> look through these laws. Does, does the National Fishery Service have <coughs> jurisdictional status and state waters to tell these people they're going to do this. You know, stuff like that. And uh, this is why, you know, if you turn around and you violate the law and you're right, there you go. You can't do this. You can't have your permits. You're done. You got to get compensated somehow. Thank you for that. Yeah. Any other comments on what pot tagging program? All right. So seeing none, since there are no more further comments to be presented at this time on behalf of the Department of Environmental Management, I'd like to thank you for attending and your comments. This time, I will declare the public hearing to be closed. Again, please be reminded that the public comment period will conclude at 4 p.m. on November 29th. Thank you. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.